Hello and welcome to episode 16 of the Wilder Podcast. I am Chloe and recording alongside me today is my husband Tom. Like every single week I'm here, just in case you're wondering, we are now next to each other recording. Um, and, and welcome listener. Before we get into this episode, I think we had a chat before and we think it's worth just recapping the principles of the Wilder Podcast and the Grange Project and what this is about. And then we'll go into an amazing talk on ecopreneurship and vertical farming. But so we are husband and wife. We've taken the step to move to Monmouthshire, beautiful Monmouthshire and wild 80 acre farm here, as well as documenting our journey as we do that via the website of the Grange Project. So grangeproject.co.uk and also via the Wilder Podcast as well. And it's not just about the wilding events as well. We want to evidence that it is also kind of commercially viable to do this. There's benefits for not just nature, but obviously for the community and also for our local partners. So there's a lot going on here and hopefully feel free to go back to episode one if you're feeling that brave, but you know, hopefully you can join us for the journey and see where we get to. So in common with the majority of our episodes, we're going to start today with a little update about what's been happening on the Grange Project. I don't know whether should we connect to our volunteers day to start with or... It's definitely worth mentioning that, of course, last episode we launched our first Volunteers Day and we've been really happy with the results, actually, with people actually want to come, which I think is a really positive step forward in our journey. And we're going to have a great team there on the day. Now, slightly terrifying, we've now got to organise it all. And it's like, you know, health and safety and equipment to organise and trees to buy and a whole bunch of stuff that we haven't done before, but can't be that hard, can it? No, and I think it's really useful to have that date to hold us to uh, and to work towards. So now I'm, I'm really excited and I cannot wait to meet. There's a whole load of people who I have no idea where they've come, where they've found us, what they're interested in. And I can't wait to meet them and hear their stories about what's drawn them to come and spend a day with us. So that is Saturday the 16th of March and the link will be in the show notes. Um, we also had a visitor, haven't we, recently? We're very lucky to welcome Sarah King from Rewilding Britain, who walked and talked and lunched with us for a very pleasant few hours. And her wisdom and knowledge of rewilding theory, practice, ecopreneurship, the direction of Rewilding Britain, fantastic. We gained so much from the conversation. And she's our point of contact here. And we're now actually listed on the Rewilding Britain website. I think we're the second site to be listed in Wales. And that's really cool. And it's just, it's nice to have the support of a bigger organization of super smart experts that we can go to and go, we think this is a good idea. Is it actually a stupid idea? <laughs> and basically... We, ha- we had a long list of potentially stupid questions for Sarah when she came and she was very patient and let us work through them all. So yeah, we were so appreciated. Probably should mention a job role. What's her job? So Sarah's head of the Rewilding Network. For those people that don't know, it's this amazing resource to where anyone who meets the criteria can register to be part of the network. And with that, you can have access to other people talking about their experiences of rewilding, people putting amazing resources about things like how to create a brush pile or an invertebrate mound, or should I put six cows or 12 cows on my site? You know, all the kind of questions that rewilders debate together. So it's a fantastic place to go and share knowledge and learn from the wisdom of other projects. So one last thing before we go into the interview with Tony from Green Up Farm is we've got a new starter, although not so new. It's worth mentioning. We've got an interview with Ella, who's joined us here at the Grange Project to help us with kind of community and social media um, on a kind of part-time basis. She's brilliant. She's a real asset to the team. I'm not going to go into too much detail because there's, there's a short chat right at the end of this podcast. It's hilarious and just worth listening to the last story she tells, if nothing else, on this episode. So please let us know and please give her a warm welcome if you see her on social media. So should we get into our interview for today? Mm-hmm. Go on, after you to introduce it. I wonder whether we should give a bit of context because this is a slightly different episode perhaps than some of our regular listeners will be used to. We're not talking about the world necessarily or even biodiversity loss directly or climate change, but we are talking about a idea or a way of producing that helps to address all of those crises. And this is, I think, probably one of Tom's favourite episodes because it is quite a business focus. Ecopreneurship. Ecopreneurship. Uh, would be the phrase that I'm trying to socialise as much as I can. But yeah, and it is definitely one of my favourite episodes, although there are many, so that's not saying much. But it was really refreshing to speak to a grassroots company, because essentially what they are, they're only a couple of years old, mm-hmm. who've come out of the city and decide to try and do something that's going to be a net positive for the world as opposed to a net negative. I don't want to give too much away, but we get the full journey. And Tony just essentially bears all, like shares the positives and negatives, how they've made it a success, and really, you know, almost shows a blueprint for other people to follow in her wake. So we hope you enjoy our interview with Tony. It's with great pleasure I can welcome Tony to the podcast. Hello. Hi there. How are you doing? 
very well. I'm glad we've got this. We've, I've been looking forward to this chat ever since you and I had that initial call. It was really, really inspirational. So thank you for, for finding the time to have a chat. No, thank you. It's fantastic to be here and it's great to meet you both and to be on the show. In keeping with tradition, would you mind introducing yourself and how you found yourself creating Greenup Farm and getting yourself into your entrepreneurship role that you're in now? Oof. Well, my name's Tony. I'm the co-founder of Greenup Farm. My husband and I began the business back in November 2021. Um, we moved to lovely Pembrokeshire back in 2019, just before we went into lockdown. So during lockdown, we were both furloughed. We got to enjoy the beautiful area that we live in. So we were quite lucky. You know, <laughs> we were quite happy about lockdown. <laughs> there was no tourists, so we could mm-hmm. just really enjoy our, our environment. Also, I was not very happy with my employment at the time. I was working remotely, working for tech companies in sales and marketing positions. So during that time, we became very aware of our environment and we became very aware of nature and the green desert that surrounds us. That's how we refer it to the agriculture and the mono agriculture that is here. And it's really concerning because it is just on our doorstep and we see it every day. You know, we can't enjoy the area. There's no biodiversity. There's no native trees here. So it's quite scary, really. And I guess we wanted to do, set up our own business, first of all. We wanted to work together and we thought, you know, our backgrounds, we'd be able to do something quite productive. We wanted to do food. We wanted to grow food. We thought about traditional farming, doing a small holding, that type of thing. But I think when it hits you that you think, you know, monoculture and everything like that and the weather climate and the change for all that, I guess through research, we came across indoor farming and thought that actually might be a really good way to encourage biodiversity because we're growing in a controlled, smaller environment. We can grow more produce in our little small environment than a field can. So that's where we sort of started our research and we got on that journey, really. You mentioned that you sort of become aware of this green desert during lockdown. So that, that's really interesting. So it's not that long ago that, so before you were doing the professional thing with professional industries. And so, so your journey has been pretty rapid and pretty fast in terms of that pivot to ecopreneurship. Yeah, I guess so. Prior to that, I'd lived in London for 18 years. So you're in that bubble. You don't see beyond the tube line. You know, you don't get out of London very often. <laughs> well, it doesn't allow you to leave for some reason. <laughs> and if you do, you go to the beach or you go away on holiday. So it's not until you immerse yourself in the countryside and actually see it for its reality before you actually see where the problems lie. If you're a visitor to the area, it's quite easy just to think, oh, okay, it's beautiful, it's pretty, there's plenty of fields and lovely animals in those fields. But until you live there, you don't really understand it. I'm really interested in that journey of understanding because I go for a lot of walks with my friends in the countryside and they all hate going for walks with me because I moan about the <laughs> the lack of diversity I can see. And I think, but that's quite a big mindset shift to go from, oh, look at this beautiful English countryside to, oh, look at the lack of biodiversity. What kind of took you on that journey? What influenced that? Was it reading? Was it talking to other people? Was it documentaries? I'm kind of curious about that. I think a lot of it has come from conversations me and Alex have. He's very environmentally aware. We do watch a lot of documentaries. We're quite big fans of George Monbiot. And so we, you know, we discuss what he writes in The Guardian, you know, and uh, on social media. So that has drawn us more into that conversation. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned George because I read a piece of his a few weeks ago because we, I guess, thinking about this idea of, you know, how do you produce food in a way that is kind of sustainable and in line with an environmental ethos you know we were looking at market gardens and some of those ideas and then I read a piece by George who basically in his normal you know very mild self was kind of quite critical in a way of the idea of a market garden because actually it's not going to solve the food crisis like we can't produce enough then you know and I thought it was really I hadn't really considered that point before of how you can be very idealistic about something so it's really interesting that that took you to your place of thinking about kind of indoor farming very important to say there that you know we're not throwing shade at market gardens i think that there's some people who make amazing jobs at it but we'll put a link to that article for if people are interested in exploring that more in the show notes i think the solution is not one way 
I think is a combination of different ways. So that might be a market garden, that might be indoor farm, that might be fields of crops. But I think it's not one solution fits every problem. I think we need to explore all the options and try and adopt different ways of approaching the way we grow our food. Yeah, I mean, as you say, to address the biodiversity crisis, we need a diverse range of solutions. Absolutely. And and I guess for people, what is an indoor farm and what is green up farm? Yeah, basically. So we're a very low tech indoor farm. We have a commercial unit. So prior to us moving in, it would be a production kitchen. We grow under lights, so we have shelves and we grow microgreens and microherbs at the moment and other speciality crops. As we've only been going two years, we are looking to expand the business over the next five. But in the first two years, we're focusing on the micro crops and mastering that in a hydroponic way. So we do not use soil. Again, topsoil is not eco-friendly to use topsoil in farming and also we work directly with hospitality sector so that type of outdoor soil going into a kitchen is not really hygienic so we grow in a medium called coca coya we will seed that out and we sell our produce live to chefs again excuse my absolute ignorance here when you say people quite a few people say microgreens micro herbs but what are they and what makes them, I mean, I, I guess I know the answer here, but, <laughs> but what makes them micro and why is that different and why is that preferable to some people? Basically, micro greens, micro herbs, whatever turn of phrase you want to use, are the first shoots of, uh, of a seed. So they do not need any additional nutrients from soil or any other type of fertilizer. So they get all of their nutrients from their husk. So we then grow those to about 14 days to some of them might take up to a month and then they are used for dishes in hospitality. So fine dining, we'll use them as a word I hate, but I'll use it as garnish. (laughs) But they are nutritionally more rich than their mature counterparts. They have loads of flavor that you just wouldn't imagine that they have. So a tiny little shoot will have bags of flavor and bags of color, and it just looks fantastic on a plate. And can people use microgreens as a, like a home chef, as a home cook? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of growers do provide, sell their produce direct through uh, farmer's markets or they will do farm shops and delis. Alex has a background in hospitality, so that was a natural pathway for us. And I think also because I've got quite a corporate background, I'm used to working with other businesses. I think working with the public sort of had a bit of fear for me. (laughs) So we felt it was It was quite a natural fit to work with hospitality. And also it means we've learned a lot because we deal with the same people week in, week out. We're dealing with chefs who understand flavor. A lot of them do grow their own. So they understand the whole process of growing. So we've learned a lot about flavors. We've learned a lot how chefs use use our product. And so that's helped us to move the business forward. I think if we were working with public we wouldn't be where we are that quickly and to help people picture the farm so you talked about this kind of idea of aquaponic and that they don't need any soil or any kind of fertilizer to grow so what would if we were to walk into your premises what would we notice in terms of how they're actually being grown so they are basically on shelves and each shelf will have a light system and then they are in a tray under those lights so that's what you'll see so you'll be quite blinded when you walk in, probably. Yeah. And after a while, it does give you a bit of a headache. But it's very clean. It's very hygienic. We can control for temperature, humidity, light, and everything. We can control the whole environment of the plants. I mean, that sounds great. And again, I, I'd love to come and visit. As I say to a lot of our guests when they describe what they, what they do, because it is really kind of really interesting. Before we get into the bit that I'm really interested in, which is kind of commercial viability of what you're doing, I'd like to explore those commercial relationships with with the growers as, as well and kind of the challenges of working B2B. Is, it has its own challenges versus B2C as well. For those of us that don't know what B2B and B2C is, like, you know, just drop an acronym. Uh, like so, so <laughs> That's me and mortals outside of the business world. So B2B is basically selling to businesses. B2C is selling to customers, general, general people, normal people. Normal. <laughs> if there is such a thing, no such thing. 
But you know, this is again, this is all I want to focus on the your eco credentials, if we want to kind of call that. So, was there anything else beyond not doing it in fields and doing it in kind of the your more kind of moral ethical way? Is there anything else you do as well to to increase those eco credentials? Yes, we are a zero waste business. That's probably one of our great strengths, but also can be quite problematic, which mm-hmm. is a massive challenge for us at the moment as we expand the business. So all our produce is provided in returnable and reusable trays and, and boxes. We deliver to a chef and the following week we'll pick up the empties and then we go home, back to the farm, we clean those down and then we can reuse them. So financially, it's a benefit to the business. It also means we haven't, over the two years, put any single-use plastic out there. None of it's had to be put into landfill. And it also has a benefit to our customers. It means they're not paying for that commercial waste, which is a massive problem for them as well. I can already hear some of our listeners thinking about energy and lights and how do you obviously minimize the energy demands of production. And you, and you mentioned at the start, this is a low-tech because that kind of implies this is also a high tech. And I was kind of curious about that too. Yeah, indoor farming can take any shape or form that you wish, really. It can be as high tech, i.e. everything can be automated. So that is from watering to lights turning off and on to temperature changing, pH levels being monitored and adjusted. So everything in your farm can be run completely automated. That costs a lot of money to have a system of on that scale. I guess also because I've worked in the tech sector and the issues around automation is that you have to buy a product from a third party and you would have to use their software. And then as a business, you're quite dependent on that business and their software. So I sort of understand that model, that business model. And so I was fearful of going down that route straight away until we've done enough research to understand where we need to automate. So we've gone completely the opposite. We do all the seeding ourselves. We do all the watering ourselves. The only thing we have is is a manual little timer that you put in a plug. And that's the only automation that we actually have because we live half an hour away. Otherwise, we were turning it on, on and off ourselves. So, yeah, we've gone that way. We are looking as we expand into how we're going to automate, what's that going to look like. Probably we will be looking at pH levels as our first issue to automate. So basically, if we look to grow more mature plants, they're going to need nutrients assistance. And for the nutrients to be absorbed by the plant, there has to be a certain level of pH. And that needs to be balanced around probably about six The issues that we have at the moment is the water where we are. So we have to adjust that pH so the plants can absorb nutrients. Sorry, it's a bit technical. (laughs) No, it's it's really interesting. I'm fascinating. And, And how energy intensive is it in terms of the light that's required to grow the plants? Yeah, I mean, we use LED lighting, which is very low wattage. We say to ourselves, we are now in the first phase of our business. Indoor using uh, artificial light is where we have to be at the moment. Our future plan is to look into passive solar greenhouses. So that's where we would like to eventually start doing research and develop that type of model. So that would mean we we can harness the sun because it just seems ridiculous that we're not using the sun. We have it there. If we can harness that and also grow produce 365, that would be the perfect model for us. So that's where we would like to go in the future. Brilliant. Just stepping back slightly from, I think, say you're zero waste, plastic free. I think that's amazing. And I think we skirted over it. I think it's worth coming back. I can only imagine how hard that is, how hard it is to create your processes, removing that, making sure you don't, anything you bring in is, is again, part of your ethos as well, not just what you output as well. I mean, have you had any challenges with clients, onboarding clients who want it to be a different way or don't want to have to faff with storing your plastic trays, et cetera? Surprisingly, no. I thought it would be when we first started trying to onboard people with our ethos of reuse that it would be a challenge. But in fact, West Wales is absolutely embracing it and they think it's absolutely fantastic. We go to many venues and we deliver every week and they're actually giving us 
the other stuff from other people that they've had. They're like, do you want this crate? Do you want this? <laughs> you know, mushroom boxes galore at the back of any pub and restaurant you will see. So I would say it's been absolutely embraced in the local area. And I would say we've had people contact us purely because we do that, because that's what they want to do. And it looks good for them. It ticks their sustainability boxes. The Welsh government is very keen for the hospitality sector to think about food waste, food miles, to think about their plastic waste. So I think everybody here seems to be really on board. Where our issues lie is moving further out of Wales. So if we're looking at bigger distribution opportunities, that's where our issue is going to be. So we've been talking with distributors that across England. Our produce can happily get there, but we are now at that crossroads of how to get it there because we've been told they're not going to embrace reuse. They're not going to bring them back to us. So we need huh. to, yeah, we, I know. So it is a challenge. So this is where, you know, the big challenge that we're at at the moment. So we are now seeking advice on different types of packaging, materials to grow in, what should we grow in. I had an interesting meeting with somebody yesterday about packaging and we were very coming from the point of it has to be compostable. That's what it has to be. And this lady I spoke to yesterday with 25 years of experience in packaging and worked for some of the big brands said, problem with composting, not all commercial venues will have food waste pickup. And if they put it into, it could end up in landfill. So if your food waste goes into landfill, it's not the right conditions for it to compost down which is a whole thing I heard about yesterday. Okay. So, yeah, so it's something we're still struggling with, trying to find the right solution for us. So we're trying to get the right knowledge to move forward. And, and what did she suggest then, if that wasn't the right course of action? Were there other options that she thought would be more preferable? Yeah, so surprisingly, so she said composting is very difficult and the facilities in the UK are not as a not a standard as they should be. So I was very surprised to hear that. And she was saying that we are better at recycling clear plastic in this country. And she said, even though now some black plastics are being made 100% recyclable, the infrared sorting machine basically can't pick it up. So black plastics can't be recycled. So her view was water bottle plastic is highly recyclable and highly desirable because it can be recycled and reused quite easily. Oh, it's so interesting, isn't it? When you go behind, you think you're doing the right thing at recycling at home and composting and putting things in different places and the energy that, you know, I spend looking at a thing of soft plastic thinking, where is it going to go? And actually, it's all that, you know, what actually is the infrastructure that we have as a country and what is it able to tolerate and manage? In some ways, I almost, it's that slight, like, I don't think I want to know because, you know, you spend so long doing it it's probably just all completely pointless. But anyway, that's not, that's not the message. <laughs> it's not so bad, so don't start recycling. <laughs> I, well, I've just Googled because I, I remember hearing something back so i've just googled it and i'm on bbc science focus for those that care right and i asked how many times can you recycle plastic and it says you could basically recycle plastic two to three times before it comes too poor to use so then i'm like sitting here going well okay so she's recommending that but but what happens after the third reuse it's going to get dumped so then in my head but obviously i'm wrong because i'm not an expert but composting even if it's not the ideal condition surely it is just designed to at some point break down as opposed to plastic over hundreds of years break down I, I buff it's hard <laughs> it's really hard it's really difficult because trying to run a commercial business and do the right thing is a real challenge and the information that you delve into you know into a rabbit hole with people contradicting themselves one website will say this is great another one will say that's great and I think the take-home message is we're not there yet there isn't that alleluia moment we have found it we haven't got that material ready and that's where innovators need to keep moving forward but what I think is really heartening is the fact you've got such demand in your area and people are really interested in the zero waste credentials because that's where the change will come, isn't it? When the customer is asking for that and then people will innovate because there's money to be made from that innovation. And, you know, it, so I think that that for me was the bit that yeah really struck me in terms of yeah, the hopeful story. Well, well, you say that. So let's get down to the nitty gritty. So you're saying it's heartening, people want it, but actually, is there a business in it? Not do I sound like Lord Alan Sugar here, but you know, tell me more. I'm cheating here because I've spoken to you before, but please also talk about that scaling from essentially a room in your house 
to the industrial unit you're at now, but useful to know the kind of square footage for both of those as well be really handy. So basically we started growing in our spare room. So if you can imagine a small double bedroom, I am actually sitting in it right now. <laughs> it's now empty. I have my office back. <laughs> I, I, can, so I like you've got the authentic shelving behind you that you probably used as well. So I can concur it is as Tony describes. And so I would say our new unit, our growing area is probably 100 square meter. That so, sounds quite big. Yeah, it's quite it's quite big compared to where we were go where we were. We had about so in in this room that I'm sitting in now, we could fit in seven shelves. So we were making probably I would average about two thousand pounds a month from seven shelves. We could push that up to probably about three, but yeah, that's what we were making. Is that seven. revenue or is that? Yeah, that's revenue. But why it is quite profitable because your costs are so low and your margins are very high. So you can buy bulk seeds. As long as you've got your trays, which you're reusing anyway, you're ready to go. And you buy your Coca-Cola. Yeah. And, you know, you buy, if you buy in bulk, it can be a really low cost to start. You know, we spent just set up, I think we spent in total a thousand pounds. You know, we made that back very, very quickly. You know, it's a very low cost and you can, with a lot of hard work, I must admit, <laughs> make a good profit. Yes. Tell us more about that hard work. Like, what is your time divvied up into? And a lot of people focus on that, but actually it's also, I'd really like to talk about it, business development. It's one thing buying the equipment, growing the thing, which is the physical process, which is hard work, but it's the black magic associated with getting someone to give you money for the thing you've grown. So can we yeah, hear about both of those? It'd be great. Yeah, I think we found what worked quite quickly. And I guess I started the business first. Uh, Alex was working full time as a baker. So I learned how to grow a small variety of different crops to try and keep it simple. Learn about five different crops and do it well. We started selling firstly to Trust in Cardigan, which is where Alex actually works. So we had an in already. <laughs> like it, like it. And so the owner is also a chef. I would turn up with boxes of microgreens, go, what do you think? <laughs> and he would go, oh, that's all right. <laughs> you know, that's very good. And then he became our first customer. And two years on, we're still providing him with crops twice a week. And then we started knocking on the door of the local pub. We went down that route. We've now been working with the chef there for two years. We're very good friends. So what we found really useful is social media. Instagram was a great tool. It was a great tool for us. We created a page. We started populating it with lovely pictures. And then we started stalking all the restaurants and pubs in the whole of Pembrokeshire. And we started just basically writing them messages, emails, trying to get, get in front of chefs. And we find what really works is getting a meeting with the chef, the head chef, go in there with some samples, whether that's live or harvested, and having that conversation with them, talking through the flavors, talking about their food, talking about their dishes. I think what you need to prove to kitchen, to a chef, is consistency. You need to demonstrate that you deliver. You say when you're going to deliver. And if you have any problems about that, you just let them know. Communication is key. And I think if you can demonstrate that, then they will be very loyal to you. And then you become an extension of their kitchen, which is, yeah, sometimes can be... <laughs> A little bit annoying, <laughs> <laughs> but you become part of their brigade. You know, they do adopt you and it's a great sector to be involved with. So it's Green Up Farm on Instagram. And I've just seen the picture of your unit. That is unbelievable. So yeah, if you're on Instagram, definitely just look them up. Yeah, I was thinking like, what can you do this visual apart from photos of your unit, but you've got some beautiful food, which I assume is from your clients, right? That are using your microgreens. So amazing pictures here of, of how it's being used, apart from making me really hungry. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's fascinating. Now, you're being very kind of open and sharing here, which which obviously, you know, we really appreciate. You know, some people may think, well, hang on, why are you sharing so much information? What happens if someone competes with you? Why are you being so free and open with the information you're sharing? Well, what we do, our crops do have a shelf life. And so we are very driven by that. So our sales are very driven by that. So we uh, we have to sell, at the moment, we sell locally. Or we sell mm -hmm. across West Wales and we deliver ourselves. If somebody wants to, we have growers 
like us up in North Wales. We have growers like us in uh, South Wales. There's enough space for everybody. (laughs) (laughs) And also you can grow for yourself. You know, it's a great hobby to have and it becomes quite obsessive. And what's beautiful about it, you have something to eat in two weeks and you can watch them grow every day and you'll notice that, you know, that happen. Well, I mean, the our comparison is Tom Spinach, which he like. Hey, 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 hey. No, 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 no. Let's tell the story. So, like these, we haven't. I know she hasn't been mentioned on the podcast for a long time, Tom. Do you I, we we, we like, well, you tell the story. The last episode, you said that I was a really good failure, but we were talking about my my spinach. So, I think. Well, let's let's explain the failure. So, no, it went, well, to start with, it was really successful. You loved watching them. They emerged from their little, you know, the and then there came the the relocation, didn't it, to the no dick bed and what happened to the spinach? Well, this is it. This is it. Why my this is why my new calling is microgreens, Chloe, because. <laughs> I, I, I've proven that I've got proficiency in the, the start yeah. and I've proven that maybe I am not diligent enough <laughs> when it comes to actually nurturing it out of the ground. So that's <laughs> wonderful. If you're someone listening to this podcast thinking, oh, you know, this is something I could do. Like, I could look at indoor farming and what how that would meet the needs of my local area. What advice would you give someone sort of the start of this journey? I would say do not go overboard and spend too much money. Do buy the basics that you need. So that is a shelf. That is some lights. That's a couple of trays, some medium, whatever you prefer to grow in, and some seeds and get going and get practicing. That's what I would say is probably the best advice I can give. Just do it. Don't think I need to buy all this stuff and I need to invest all this money. And I would just try and keep it simple. The more you grow, the more confident you'll be and the passion will come. And then you'll just want to go out there and show people what you're doing. So those who all know me know that I get in, you know, I'm getting very excited at this point now because it's it's just really exciting. It's really down the ethics and ethos of, of what we're trying to achieve at, at Grange Project. And I know that from our previous conversations, we mentioned, I mentioned to you to about franchising and whether or not, you know, because of the knowledge you've got, not just on how to grow, but also on the legalese side of life and the commercials and the price points and how to negotiate what kind of language to use, which I think is the things that might put other people off. You've now built that knowledge base. Is that something you've thought about doing, franchising? Yeah, definitely. I think it's something that we definitely would love to look into in more detail. I think from our point of view, we would love to see a green up hub outside every major city in the UK. We would like to keep produce local, reduce food miles. And I think that is a really inventive way of doing this. Because if we try and distribute from our headquarters in Pembrokeshire to London, the freight on that and the food miles on that, it would be better if we had a, a location outside London. Yeah. wouldn't have to cost the earth because we could be in a an industrial site. That's the beauty of the growing microgreens that we can do it in any location. So, I mean, if people are listening to this going, I could do that. I could, you know, I've got, I'm going to stop my corporate job and, and my, convert my spare room, my garage and, and get the ball rolling. Is there an email or somewhere you direct someone just to get, get in touch with you and to start a conversation? Yeah, absolutely. So you can get in touch with us on our Instagram page at Green Up Farm or send me an email on hello at greenupfarm.co.uk. It's really great to hear your kind of reflections around if people are in the position of thinking about working with microgreens. But, you know, I guess you've also been on a journey from that corporate space into a, as Tom describes it, that kind of ecopreneurship role. And I suppose for anyone thinking about starting a new business in line with their value set and in line with environmental credentials, what sort of advice would you give them as, as part of your learning journey from this experience? The advice I would give them is know your product and really understand why you're growing that product. If you haven't got that passion, it doesn't translate when you're conversing with uh, customers. I would also advise stick to one market when you're selling. So whether that's hospitality, whether that's markets, whether that's retail, really immerse yourself in that market, become an expert of that field. And then I think you will develop your skill set on being able to sell to customers of that market. Okay, so I've got one last question, just because, again, it's this is a complete realm that I, I am, as we've just discussed, probably not very well qualified for. And you did touch on it, but I just wanted to understand it. You know, what's the three to five year trajectory for what you hope to achieve? And specifically, I'm interested in you know, microgreens right now. Like you say, you pick them specifically for all the obvious reasons we've discussed. But, you know, in my head, at some point, being able to grow 
insert large vegetable here in a controlled environment kind of farm like you guys have got is is that something where you want to go and, and how hard do you think that transition might be yeah so the next phase we see for ourselves is to do the passive solar greenhouses that's where we want to go next where we're located we're at, on a site called food center wales they're fantastic units for startup businesses so we're really fortunate to be there they are looking to acquire some land, a farm of 100 acres, and we will get to select a corner of that. We only need a little corner. We only need a little little space. And we'll start working with, think the hopefully, the local university on to develop this system. And then what we would like to see, once we have established that, then we would like to maybe develop hubs further afield. So we'll start looking for maybe look for other sites that we can do this model on. And that will be bigger vegetables, not just microgreens. And Yeah, absolutely. So basically what we need to achieve to grow more mature plants is we need to be able to have access to the sun because it's not cost effective to grow more mature plants in a controlled environment where you're in the grid, basically. Yeah. So with electricity prices, they're always fluctuating. You never, you know, it's very difficult to be able to mitigate that cost and i think we can't justify growing crops for three months in our farm it would cost too much Mm -hmm. and we'd have to charge too much we tell our customers sometimes go to tesco sorry we can't grow that for you (laughs) it's too expensive yeah perfect well uh, i hope people have as much out of this as as chloe and i have it's been an absolutely fascinating discussion thank you very much what we normally do is come back is there anything the last thing you'd like to say at all before we kind of close this off um, if anybody wants to know about, find out more about what we do and wants to know more about growing microgreens and microherbs, then please get in touch. It'd be fantastic to hear from people. Perfect. So we recorded that interview about two months ago now. Yeah. So listening back to it, it just, it got me excited all over again for the opportunities that are going to arise for entrepreneurial type people with the right morals and ethics and drive to make something successful. And this is just one example. And I do hope that we can reach out to other people who are doing something similar and to shine a light on the good work that they're doing. But we still haven't quite managed to invite a team over at Greenock Farm to come and visit you, have we? But we'd like to get them over just to pick their brains even more and also taste some of their micro greens and micro herbs. Well, Father Christmas obviously knew that we'd recorded this episode because I got in my stocking this year a microgreen grow kit, which I'm looking forward to test out. And just to prove to Tom that spinach is not the only vegetable that we can kill in this family, that we can also look at destroying some microgreens. I, I just think I've been unfairly targeted in this, but I think there's some quite good evidence to suggest otherwise. Sullivan. For me, one of the surprising takeaways listening back to this episode was around the packaging issue. I feel like there's a risk I could start getting a bit over-obsessive around packaging. I haven't told you this, Tom, but the other day I emptied a packet of brown sugar into my glass jar. And I know I should go to my zero-waste stall, but we have three children and I'm working and it's just really hard. But anyway, so I had my Tate and Lyle packet of brown sugar and I looked at the pack and I was like, okay, so is this a, can I send this off with my plastic bags for the soft plastic recycling in the supermarket? Or what can I do with it? And I, I couldn't find any information on the back of the packet around whether it was recyclable or not. So I emailed Tate and Lyle and said, Strong. I am a concerned consumer who really likes your brown sugar, but I do not like the fact that I cannot work out how to recycle your plastic. And they replied and said, oh, sorry, we're not. this is something we're working on and it's not currently recyclable. And apparently there are some transport issues around brown sugar and it has to be the certain sort of plastic, otherwise it degrades or something. I guess I was trying to think about this idea of being a consumer, a client, a customer, whatever, who is concerned about the environment and communicating that to the team at Tate Lal so that they can, you know, hear the message that's hopefully coming from people around what they need to move towards in order to encourage customers to come back and shop with them in the future. Firstly, Chloe, that doesn't surprise me. I'm surprised I replied, which, which I suppose is a positive. Not surprised that you, you know, went above and beyond because you've only got three children and multiple jobs. So that's fine. Um, but I will echo your point about packaging. It's obviously a significantly more complicated issue than you and I appreciate because I'm just sitting there going, it's brown sugar. How complicated can it be? Surely there are better options than non-recyclable plastic. Anyway, maybe we should just get a guest on. That's what that suggests. Maybe you can re- email back your friends over at Tate and Lyle and suggest that they come on the podcast and talk to us about it. I'm sure they'll be delighted. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, uh, it's been another great episode. And I hope, as ever, listeners, you're enjoying it. One last plea from me before we move on is 
if you do get a chance. If you have listened to this episode and enjoyed it and it has added value to your day, then there's a, a thing you can do to make a huge difference, which is just go onto wherever you listen to your podcast, ideally Spotify or Apple Store, and just leave a quick review there. I can't express how much of value that brings. And if up until now, this episode hasn't been enough to get you on to rate it, just stick around for this chat with Ella and hear the story that she goes on to tell about her experience with the Grange Project right at the end. And if that doesn't motivate you to rate and review the podcast, I don't know what will. Ella, welcome to the World of Podcast. Hello. Just before we jump into this chat, it's worth mentioning that Chloe isn't here. She, unfortunately, unfortunately <laughs> um, has drawn the long or the short straw and is in charge of the children at the moment. So I am here just to probably have a chat with you and introduce you to the listeners of the World of Podcast. So before we jump into that, and as you know, in keeping with tradition, could you introduce yourself, give us a bit about your background and how you find yourself here at The Grange Project? Hello, I'm Ella. I am 24 years old and I'm a local gal. I'm from Abergavenny. I left university a few years ago with an English and education degree with sort of no idea what I wanted to do. I then went to live in Spain and taught children there for the year and then came back here and decided that I wanted to take a step in a different direction and then I reached out to Tom and Chloe who have given me this amazing opportunity to come and start with them within the Grange project as digital marketing and social media which is definitely something that I find really interesting and their story completely inspired me. And I'm so excited to learn more about the environment and how we can help it. And I also love their approach of the community side. You know, if the government can't do anything, what can we do as a community? And how can we come together as a community to create a better world? Yeah, well, I think, to be honest, you make your own luck in this world. And the reality is, you know, you are on LinkedIn, which not that many people are, especially you know, from the educational sector like you, you came from. Yeah. And you know, the fact you're willing to engage and reach out and, and try and make a change. So you, know, you, you definitely make your own luck. Uh, we're very lucky to have you here. For the listeners, so Ella will be leading on the kind of community side of life, just making sure that we get all the events organized for 2024 that we want to. Definitely starting with regular volunteer days, but also branching out once we get confident with that into other activities. And on digital marketing, obviously, you don't have that much background in it, but I've been really impressed at how quickly you've picked it up, but not only picked it up, but also thinking outside the box. It's a sign of a good team member when Ella basically says, no, Tom, that's a really rubbish way of doing it. <laughs> and this is the better way. And I'm like, oh, you're right. Okay, do it that way. Uh, and that's exactly what we want here. People that are independently minded who can think for themselves and really just use their passion to push things forward. And there's going to be much more that, that you do just than that. And I think we, you know, if we wanted to list all the things you do, I think we'd be here for a good hour or two. So what has been your experience with the Grange Project so far? Yeah, it's been absolutely amazing. You've got such an amazing piece of land here. And it's been so interesting to come in through autumn and winter and see, you know, the seasons change and how that affects different things here. But also I'm so excited <laughs> to see the warmer months and I will be ready for spring. Yes. Shall we talk about the incident? So currently Tom and Chloe are having some drainage put in on the land and that involves a lot of mud and digging onto what which is already a very muddy and quite a difficult track yeah, to cut down. Yeah. There's no lights. You know, I drive a sixteen year old micro, so yeah. Which you're very proud of. Yeah, my baby. Mm -hmm. But um she <laughs> she struggles. And the one day we had to park our cars up the top of the track and I had left my phone in another car. So Hoppers 5, pitch black, cow grates, ditches. And yeah, my car got stuck and I stood there and cried for half an hour because <laughs> I couldn't call anyone. There was such a big pile of mud that no one could see me with my hazards on yelling. Yeah, it was just... To be fair, you weren't that far from the house. and. No. You'd handed it to the kid. We were on the full kid duty, so yeah. we weren't thinking. We thought Ella's dealt with. We'd, have, gone. we'd have to worry about Ella anymore. <laughs> Little did we know that you were going through this emotional turmoil <laughs> as you, I mean, very bravely decided to three-point turn on a very narrow track. Ended up, if you don't mind saying, pretty impressively in the middle of this boggy field, halfway down the hill. And then I was, I think, on my phone. Or, yeah. oh, no, sorry, looking up to the children. And I just saw this vision of... I mean, despair. So despair. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm up to the window of the house. Covered in mud. And I feel a bit guilty about this because what was my initial reaction? Oh, you just laughed. I, 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 but I needed that. I think I needed that to calm me down a bit and bring me back down to earth because I was in a right state. It's, it's a bit, I think it's just a military thing, isn't it? Yeah. I think when things are going wrong and there's nothing you can do about it, yeah. it you've got to either laugh or That's or cry or, or in your case, a bit, a bit, a bit of both. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but I made it. I'm still here. And yeah, didn't quit as well. No, and um, lesson learned. I just need a torch on me at all times. So. Because you're not a massive fan of the dark as well. I think, you know, no. fine. Right. Well, hopefully that that little story mm-hmm. and our little chat has given listeners a bit of an insight about you, your role, and hopefully, you know, when they do, or if they do reach out, um, so they know who they're talking to. So thank you Definitely. very much. And we're, like I said, Final Time is very happy to have you here as part of the team. Thank you very much.